Hello there, my mate Vince here. Face reveal. You know, I got a message the other day saying, face reveal, I always used to listen to Vince. Now I see him, I see an old man waiting to die. What? How could you write that? An old man waiting to die? It must be the uh, gray hair. I'm only in my forties. Anyway, I ain't dying it, so get over it. In this video today, I am gonna be working on everything. So I'm just gonna be trying to fix a wide variety of stuff. So let's just get straight into it and see if we're successful. Might be, might not, but it's worth giving it a go because if something's broken already, not working, faulty, then what difference does it make? If you fail, it's still broken, not working, faulty. So you might as well give it a go. So let's get started on the very first item. So to start off this fix it extravaganza, we have this item here. It's a Nintendo Switch controller, Geotech. So it says the A button doesn't work properly and they replaced it. To me, that looks like some sort of Argos returns. So uh, yeah, and sure enough, when I connect it up, it's got power in it and I can connect up everything, but it's not the A button that doesn't work. The B button's registering as the A button. Very strange. You can also replace these little thumbsticks here with longer ones. So it's a nice little controller and you've got buttons at the back here. So if we were to go into test input devices, this will allow us to check all the buttons. Yeah, now look at this. Let me zoom in and show you that B is actually A. But A is A, because sometimes on controllers it can be mixed when you're using other controllers on the Switch. But look, A, X, Y, A, 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 A. So there is no B. So there we go, that's the problem there. But check this out. I'm wondering whether somebody was messing around with the program button, because there's a program button here. So I wonder, have they accidentally programmed B? to A, you know, if a kid was using it, they might have been hitting the buttons at the back here and they might have accidentally held that down. I haven't read up how to do the programming yet, but why don't we try to reset the controller and see if that fixes it. So I've had a look in the instructions and this is the reset button just here. So I don't know how long we have to hold it in for. Let's hold it in now. Let's hold it in for five seconds. The lights have gone off. All right, let's see if that will have reset it. So now I presume it's not gonna sync up automatically. No, okay. Oh no, it is gonna sync up automatically. Okay, let's see if that's fixed it. It's weird, when you reset something, you expect it to be back to factory. No, still the same. Right, okay, let's see if we can program back to B again. Oh, you only program the back buttons. Right, so there definitely is a fault here. Interesting, okay. I thought maybe you could program other things on here. Right, I mean there is a way in the switch menu that you can swap buttons around, but the thing is it obviously means the controller is faulty. So let's uh, take it apart and see what's going on. There's a load of crosshead screws at the back here. Will it be something straightforward or not? So we just need to undo various screws from the back and also some inside screws as well holding down a circuit board because we need to get to the side where the buttons are to see what's going on. Right now, so these two are behaving the same as each other. Why? So here I think all of them will be connected to each other on one of the pads, but not on the other ones. So let's see. This one here. No, no, no. Let's try this one. Yes, yes, yes. So all those pads are connected to each other. Now, that pad's not connected to here, but is this pad connected to here? Yes, it is. But there we go. That's our problem. So if you have a look, that's not connected to here and here. That one's not connected to here and here. Yeah, but yet yeah, these two are connected. Why, why are they connected? Let's see how they're completely connected. Let's get a resistance reading. So let's go on the ground side. That should be the same as my lead shorting, which it is under one ohm. Let's try this side. There you go, so it's near enough a full short. Put my leads together, yeah. If I was to go to here and here, there's, uh, it's in the mega ohms. Right, okay, interesting. What's caused that? It's a real interesting one. 
Right, so now we know we're dealing with this side here. There's a via here and a via here and a via here. So let's start with that via at the bottom there. So I look really closely and I can see that from the shorted pads on the A and the B button, they go to little vias that go to the other side of the board and then they travel a little distance and then they go through more vias to come back through to the original side of the board and then to more vias, etc. But anyway, if you trace them, they end up going to the main little chip that was hidden under the battery. So that must be the kind of brains of the operation to decide what buttons are being pressed. So let's have a close look at that chip to see if we can see anything that doesn't look right. I think it's this one. It goes into the chip. Right, what's that there? Is that a little short there? Let's zoom in. Oh, you beauty. Look at that. A tiny little short just there and I bet that's the one that goes off to the B obviously no point in doing it now with my continuity tester because it's gonna beep isn't it but look that's a little short there so let's get a tiny bit of flux get the soldering iron on and try to get rid of that little bridge just in between there so that is a manufacturing a fault from manufacturer amazing never seen that before a tiny bit of flux which looks a lot now let's see if we can just get rid of that. Can't even see where it is. There we go. I think that's gone. Let's clean it up with some isopropyl alcohol, my favorite. Right, as you can see, the bridge has now gone. Yeah, they're not no longer shorted. So let's see if, first of all, before we uh, check, let's just go straight onto here. So, boom, no longer there. But I cut a little bit out from the video earlier on, so this bit's a bit confusing. These little test points are the other side of the buttons, so they're connected to the buttons. So remember before I showed you that there was a short between A and B on the actual pads? Well, those pads, not the ground side, the other side, they're linked to these little test points on this side that say KB, KA, KX and KY because B, A, X and Y are the buttons and remember we had a short between B and A so when there's no short between B and A now that will correspond to no short on the other side as well. So fantastic for some reason this was just bridge from manufacture so let's put it back together and then I'll show you it working on the Nintendo Switch. Check it out B B B B B B B B B B B B B how nice is that? I have never seen a bridge on a chip before from manufacturer. I've seen it plenty of times when I do the soldering. They're all over the place, but not from manufacturer. So that's a really interesting one. So 100%, that was 40 straight out of the factory. So I thoroughly enjoyed that one. What a great start to this uh, video. Now, the next item we're gonna be doing is a very expensive little projector. Now, before we get onto this little projector, this old man is gonna talk about today's sponsor, PCB Way. PCB Way have over a decade experience in the PCB industry. They have state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities and they use the latest technology to produce high quality PCBs that meet your specification. At PCB Way, they have a range of services including PCB prototyping, PCB assembly, flexible PCBs, high density PCBs, CNC machining, and 3D printing. So check out the links in the description down below. So a massive thank you to PCB Way for sponsoring the My Mate Vince channel. Now, let's look at this Nebula projector made by Anchor. Now I've had a few things from Anchor in the past, power banks and also a little speaker and stuff, and I've had no problems with their products at all. So it was sent in by a Patreon called Neil, and a viewer obviously. It says here, hey Vince, we spoke on Patreon about you taking a look at my fancy projector. The unit seems to power on, but no picture. Only got about 20 hours on it, so a lamp failure seems unlikely. Of course it's just out of warranty. Well, isn't that always the way? And it says here, so rather than bin it, I thought you could either save it for me or at least make 
an interesting video. Cheers, Neil. So thank you very much for that. So obviously it's just out of warranty. Now I've turned it on and it is uh, it's wearing up and stuff, but it isn't showing any light whatsoever. So if I turn it on here, apparently you could get these in a portable version as well with batteries i don't think this is the battery one so the idea is you charge it up you get about three hours use out of it but i think this is the mains only one so right now it is actually making noises the fans running little light on the back here but it's not uh it's not doing anything no, there's no light there whatsoever so is it going to be fixable i don't think so i think it's going to be super complicated on the inside i don't think something like this is going to have a replaceable lamp because there's probably some sort of led type arrangement but i know zero about projectors so it might be interesting to see somebody that's never taken apart a projector before attempt to fix one interestingly when it came through on the box check out this never seen these stamps before it says magic circle and it says rub with a coin for heads or tails so i've already done three of them and look you rub here isn't that nice i've never seen a stamp do that before so that's kind of clever good isn't it i'll save those two for someone else right let's take it over to the mat take it apart and see if we can find out what's happening it also turns off as well so the brains of it is working and the remote controls working when you turn it off from memory i think it goes to green yeah it goes to green there so uh, i've tried doing the reset where you hold down you unplug it hold down the power button for 12 seconds and turn it back on it doesn't make any difference at all so let's strip it down just in case Neil or somebody else has dropped it but doesn't remember dropping it and it might be some kind of broken connection somewhere or a loose wire but I don't think it will be I think this is just a natural failure and personally I don't think it's going to be fixable so it comes apart lovely and easy there's just six screws at the bottom and then you have to just prise it open annoyingly this thing is immaculate on the inside as you would expect it's had hardly any use so there's no loose ribbon cables it doesn't look like there's been any drop damage or anything like that everything looks absolutely perfect i do just run around the ball quickly with my multimeter checking for a few shorts and the capacitor it hasn't got any signs of anything i plug it back in and i test it with the fleur cam Annoyingly, just like most of my videos, the FLIR cam doesn't show up any problem whatsoever. So the next thing I'm going to do now is test for voltages around the place because that may actually indicate that one of the voltage rails are missing. So let's pick up the video when I'm doing that. Right, okay. Well, we haven't got 3.3 volts there. If we get our thing in here. Everywhere where voltage is listed, so 3.3 is here you will see that we do have it. 3.3, one8 12.5. But yeah, no 3.3 here. So let's take it all apart. Let's see where that 3.3 goes to. And maybe we can concentrate in this area. Right, so 3.3 is a tiny little via just here. So next to the pad, there's a little via. So it has to be this one here. And then that's the other via. Right, so where do you go to? So it has to go to here, but it also goes to here. And here. But it doesn't go anywhere. So maybe that is unpopulated. Maybe that's for something else then. Ah, that's a shame. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's got nothing to do with anything. There's no 3.3 .3 there because it's not going anywhere here. So it's not that. Well, I think the sensible thing to do would be to look online because I'm not going to get anywhere here, I don't think. But let's strip it down just a little bit further, just in case something might become more obvious. You know, if I get down into here, then one of these wherever these are connected to might not be pushed in properly. So I stripped this thing down completely. It is very serviceable, meaning if you wanted to change the speakers, that's all possible. If you want to change the input board at the back with HDMI and where the power comes in, that's all possible. Unfortunately, what's not possible is for me to see what the fault is because there's nothing obvious. There's no burning on the board. There's no obvious shorts on the board when I use my multimeter, checking all the capacitors, and all the connections and ribbon cables are all perfect so i'm going to look online to see if i can learn a little bit more about projectors and see if anybody else has this problem with this projector or other projectors 
Well, I've just been doing a bit of research for the last couple of hours, and what I've learned is that they're incredibly complicated. So, when I look on YouTube, as far as I can see, there's nobody attempting. A few people have done teardowns of DLP projectors, but there's nobody really attempting to fix ones this small. They have bigger ones there where you have like mirrors at 45 degrees and then massive like what look like halogen lights shining onto it. Uh, but you see, this is just far more complicated because of the size of it. But I think I've got I've got a little bit more of my head around it than I had before. So basically, looking on the website for the Anker Solar projector here, Nebula, it says display technology, 0.23 DMD in 1080p DLP. DLP means digital light processing. And basically, the LED light is supposed to be 30,000 hours. Remember, this has lasted around 20. And it's supposed to be 400 ANSI lumens. That's how bright it should be. Obviously, the brighter it is, the better it is because you can watch it in more daylight conditions. So basically, uh, I think how it works is, I was sort of thinking that there was going to be one main light. But I think what this is, and I'm going to just say think once, but just base this whole thing on me thinking. We have green, red and blue. So basically with green, red and blue, they're making up every single colour that we know. So for example, if you were to mix red and blue, I think it makes magenta, I think it said. If you were to mix all three of them, it makes white, believe it or not. So if you were to have a green light, a red light and a blue light, it would equal a white light. Now to make grey, what they do is they use like similar to pulse width modulation. So you know, if you had something that was like, uh, 50 volts and you wanted it to be 10 volts out what you could do is if the, if it was going to be on for five seconds you could just have it 50 volts for one second and then off for the other five seconds uh, sorry off for the other four seconds and i think that would then equal 10 volts something along those things but remember it's not over five seconds we're talking fraction of a seconds so with this here just just to make things easy, let's say if they're going to be on for a hundred times a second, I'm not saying they are, let's just say pretend they're going to be on for a hundred times a second. If you were only to have them all lit up, so use the same graph here, if you were to have all three of them on, so the red, well actually let's do red, green and blue, so they're all going to be on together at the same time for one tenth off a second, and then they're going to be off for the other nine tenths of the second, then it won't be white, it will be more grey. In real terms, it's going to be just white and then off for nine tenths of a second, but our eyes are not quick enough to pick that up. So then when the next one tenth of it, when, when the next, uh, whatever, I can't remember what I said now, one hundredth of a second or whatever, when it happens again, and then it's off for all that time, our eyes are not quick enough. So all we see is a gray image rather than it being on and off, on and off. Yeah. So these three colors along with using them on and off can basically do every single color that there is. Now in here somewhere, you're going to have something, I think it was called a DMM or I mean, it might be this DMD. Basically what it is, is going to be a massive grid with loads of tiny mirrors, yeah? So each mirror is gonna be like this if you zoom in. And they're all flat. But then what happens is, so when they're flat, the lights coming in from these LEDs are shining and basically they're bouncing off the flat mirror and they're just going away to some kind of like sink here, which must be some sort of material that doesn't reflect light. But then when they want the pixels to shine out here, the light to shine out here, they will angle these. So let's say now this is the same grid here, but yet this one here is going to be angled ever so slightly. So it, it goes up this way. And when it goes up this way, the light hits it and then comes straight out of the lens here. So it's kind of extremely clever. I can't even get my head around how they can make something this small. It's like alien technology. It's unbelievable. But anyway, I sort of get my head around that a little bit more now. It does make sense. This is just a fancy way of focusing it. So this front little thing here is just a, a way to do automatic focusing. So we don't, uh, we don't have to. Often there's a wheel here. But basically, we're getting no light at all. What's the odds of the red, green and blue not working at the same time? 
I would say extremely slim. So it'd be different, for example, if it started off and the colours went a bit funny and then like there was no blues and then a few weeks later there was no reds, then no greens, then okay, you could say that all three LEDs have failed. But for them all to just stop working, all three LEDs can't have failed. So I don't think there's actually anything wrong with this section here. I think the problem is all to do with here. Now, looking at the chips, we have two chips with DLP written on them. This one here is an annoying little BGA, so I've got no way of measuring anything on there. There is a few capacitors underneath that you might be able to get voltage from, but this is a display controller. But remember at the very beginning, I thought that maybe this was gonna be the 41 because we've got a missing thermal pad here, so this corner of the chip's not getting anything. This here is the PMIC and high current LED driver IC. So power management IC and high current LED driver IC. So this chip here is the thing that controls these, the lights. And remember, we haven't got any light. I think the problem is this here, but I don't know. Maybe it's not getting power. Now, if this was a simple chip, it'd be nice because it would just have one power into it. Annoyingly, this chip is not simple. Of course, it's not going to be simple. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen powers going into it. But it's not just that. I'm going to try to measure these now if I can. But basically, uh, I mean, it's just ridiculously complicated. And when it comes to voltage, it's not just the power ones. We're going to have all other things as well, which will need, uh, which possibly need to be measured. But how far do you take it? I'm not going to measure everything here. I don't even know if the chip's faulty. Uh, basically, I'm not going to be able to fix this. It's far too complicated. If I was to take a guess, I say that this chip here has gone faulty. Don't know why, maybe it's to do with heat. Maybe it was just again for manufacture. It just wasn't, uh, wasn't very good. And then 20 hours use, it's gone. Okay, I'm skipping through this part because I was filming for well over an hour on this. Basically, I couldn't get to any of the voltage pins here. These are the main ones like power in one, power in two, power in three, etc. Because it was on the underside of the board. And it's so tightly compact in here that the board I was looking at gets its power from the board above and there's little link ribbon cables going here and here, just tiny little Lego ones that are only about the size of a postage stamp. So basically there's not enough room to lift it up to get your probes in to measure the chip. And even if you could get your probes in, there's 25 pins on each of the chip uh, each side and it's about that big so all that's going to happen is your probes will slip and short between different ones there anyway it's kind of pointless because even if i have these voltages it doesn't mean it's okay because we've got another load of voltages here and then even if i had all these voltages it might not be getting the enable pin so it might, chip might not even be getting enabled i think the fault is with for example this chip but i don't really know it could be the board above that's not putting the voltage down to it i think the only way this is fixable because it's so complicated, is if you had another working one. And then you could swap the boards around and, for example, the lens at the front and stuff, and then you could find out by a process of elimination which is the faulty board. Then you might be able to take it from there. But look, there's no hot spots on the FLIR cam. There's no shorts on the capacitors. Everything looks perfect. All the ribbon cables are connected and also all the Lego connectors and every other cable is connected. So I think the fault is probably going to be a chip, but I've got no way of proving that. So I'm not going to waste your time on it. I haven't wasted my time because I've learned a little bit about how projectors work and I found it really fascinating much more complicated than I thought they would be. So I'm going to give this back to Neil and maybe in the future they'll start selling 41s on eBay and then he can swap boards around or they might even be spares in the future because it's an expensive item and people will want to fix it. I haven't made it worse. It works exactly the same as it did when I got it. As well as that, it's not the power supply going in to the back here because I've tried it with, my, uh, with another laptop power supply which was also 19 volts and it doesn't work. It's definitely something on the inside and I think it's this chip. But if you've worked on these or you've worked on similar small DLP projectors and you know what the problem is, again, please put it in the comments below because I won't be sending this back just yet. Anyway, let's move on to the next item. So in this one here, I'm going to be working on an Eaton 3S Mini UPS, uninterrupted power supply. So with this particular item here, the idea is you would have it connected 
into in line with, for example, your router or router, depending on what part of the world you're from. And then if you've got a voice over IP service, you would stub telephone service, even if the power coming into the house got cut because it would start working from the batteries in here. The problem with this one is that it's not charging at all. We're plugged in right now and it's not charging. Yet, if I was to turn it on, it will provide the correct voltage output and you can change it between nine volts, 12 volts, 15 and 19 volts by holding this down for eight seconds. So if I was to measure this now, I certainly would have nine volts. But then if I kill the power supply going into it, then I won't have nine volts. So it looks like for some reason, the batteries are not kicking in. So watch this now, if I go in here and here, you will see we will have nine volts. But now if I was to unplug it, then after about a minute or so, this light here will go out and also the voltage will start dropping. So obviously it's supposed to last for whatever it is, 120 minutes according to the box here, but uh, it's not doing that. So if I go on here now, if you have a look, you can see that we already haven't even got one volt in it. So the battery side of it is not working. Let's take it apart and see what's going on. Retail, these are around about 50-ish pounds. Right, here we go. Ah, oh, interesting, look at that. How easy are they to replace? That's really, really nice. So I presume that there's no uh, voltage in these ones here. That's fantastic. All right, let's see if these are completely and utterly dead. So these are 18650s, 2200 milliamp hours. Let's go to volts DC. Yeah, unfortunately they've gone below their safe level. That one there is completely and utterly dead. Yeah. Right now, what I'm gonna do is, because by rights, once these fall below a certain level, like if, I don't know, three-ish volts, they're not safe to use now. So let's get two more batteries, pop them in, and then uh, just out of curiosity, we'll put a little bit of voltage into here just to see if they do kickstart. Right, so I've got two batteries here, but they're not identical. To start with, these are 2,500 milliamp hours, while these ones here are 2,200 milliamp hours. Also, I haven't looked up the spec of these, so I don't know about like the discharge rate. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure if it's gonna to matter too much on a device like this, because it's not like a power drill that's gonna be draining loads. So I'm sure that this is gonna be a safe replacement for here. But if I'm wrong, put it down in the comments below. And obviously, if you're copying me, don't copy me. Do your own research and find out what batteries these are, and then get like for like replacements, because that's how the circuit's been designed. It is lovely, though, that it's got a uh, an option to change them over. All right, let's just do a quick measurement on here. So four volts in that one, and four volts in that one. So these ones should be fine. So negative this side here, positive up there, negative here, positive here. Now let's see if we go here, what we're reading. Right, 8.1 volts. So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna put my hand anywhere near here because I could kill myself. I'm gonna plug it in. I haven't plugged in the other side yet. I'm gonna plug it in. I wanna see if it jumps up. So one second, let me get a, a reading now. Let's see if it is gonna charge. Bearing in mind that these are nearly fully charged. So we've got 8.1 volts. Let's plug it in and see what it does. Because maybe the charging circuit's not working. Why did you have to turn it on in order to make it charge? Maybe. Right, so you can see we've got nine volt light here, and it's above 8.1. So I presume now it's charging, and it looks like it's climbing. Yeah, there we go. So let's unplug this now, and we'll see, is it gonna hold on to the nine volts? So it looks like it's nearly fully charged, because you can see we've got between three and four, and that means it is 75% plus, because that's the one that's flashing. So there we go, it just looks like failed batteries, but why did they fail in the first place? It looks like they're charging okay, and you can see now with the new batteries in here, we've got this currently set to nine volts, and it is outputting just over nine volts. So if there was a power cut, like there is now, because I haven't got it plugged into the mains, it would be powering whatever equipment you want it to power, at nine volts. So this does actually appear to be working. But what caused the batteries to fade in the first place? Let's just try, I know it's dangerous, but we'll just try to put a little bit of voltage into the batteries just to see if they do want to take a bit of voltage. So I'm going to do that with my bench power supply.
So what's interesting here is you only see the charged light when the actual mains coming in has been interrupted because then you've got a visual indication of how long it's going to last before it dies completely. So when it's plugged in normally you don't see it charging. It's only when it's unplugged from the mains that you will see the battery indicators come on. So that's quite clever so you actually can see how long your piece of equipment is going to work and whether or not it's going to go dead before the mains comes back on. Right, this is really interesting. I thought my bench power supply was playing up because I tried to put voltage into here and nothing's happening. I started off at 2 volts at uh, 200 milliamps, then 2 volts at 500 milliamps, then 3 volts, etc. Right now, I'm all the way up to 4.3 volts at 1 amp. So if you have a look here, you will see that I've got 4.3 volts. Now, if I go on to my good battery, sure enough, it's drawing. 0.998 it's gone into constant current at one amp yeah so that is drawing energy from my bench power supply this here even at the higher voltage is not drawing any amps whatsoever so it's like both batteries have just completely failed internally right let's put this back together and finish up the video just to clarify, what I actually found strange is not the fact that they were discharged, the fact that they didn't allow any charge into them whatsoever because I've had many discharged batteries and although you shouldn't charge them up, you can get a little bit of voltage into them when you use the bench power supply. But with this one, it was the same as the leads not being connected at all. They wouldn't take a charge whatsoever. Right, let's plug it in. Okay, so I've currently got it connected up to my router, which is hidden back here, and it was plugged in, and then what I did is I unplugged it, and it didn't drop the connection whatsoever. I had to change it to 12 volts because that's what the current power supply of the router is. So right now you can see that it is actually unplugged, and it is powering the router because we still have the lights on the router, and also voice over IP phone through the router still has dial tone. Hopefully you'll hear that. And it didn't break service at all. So when I unplugged it, the router didn't need to reboot itself. So obviously with new batteries, this product does work. But what's confusing for me is, why did both batteries do that? They look like they're completely open circuit. I can't get any bit of a charge into them whatsoever. So are they just a faulty batch of batteries or is there something in the circuitry here that's caused them to fail? And will these new batteries fail if, for example, I leave this unplugged for three or four hours and they drain down completely? completely, will they go down below the safe level? Has it not got the circuitry in to protect the batteries and stop it going below a certain level? An interesting device, but for me, a bit of a strange failure with both batteries. I can imagine one battery failing, but both seems a bit odd to me. So if you know the reason why, please put it down in the comments below. Having a UPS is nice, very handy, but I'll tell you what's nicer, having a working toilet. That will bring me on nicely to the next attempted fix in this video. So I noticed this a couple of months ago now. In this corner here, it's starting to get a bit of a brown patch. There's also a bit further down, a bit of a wet patch here. Same on that little corner there, it's kind of cracking. And also there's a little bit of bubbling on the paint. And if we go to this corner here, silver play button, thank you very much. If we go up here, we also have staining. Now initially I thought well has somebody just turned the tap on and it's kind of leaked out around the place and it's just dripped down. The problem is the staining hasn't gone, it's getting a little bit worse and now the toilet upstairs is blocked. Hence the reason why I need to kind of see to this now. So I've already had a look above that but the problem is above that is around about here this corner here. So I've lifted up a little bit of wood that's placed down here and basically the weird thing is the top part of this is all dry. It's further down that's where I'll show you that in a minute I have to get a torch down there. But if we go into the ensuite, unfortunately this toilet is doing something weird. Now I must say everything isn't immaculate. I know when people show you the homes they're all immaculate but you know if you're telling the truth when people say oh, I'm popping around to see you later you're running around the place trying to tidy up. Right now I've got so much stuff on my mind I'm not going to dust hoover and clean everywhere so in the video the house will look a bit of a mess. Anyway look that's clean toilet tissue down there because I undone that, well I say clean. I undone that thing there, it's still dirty water and it started to overflow out of there when this was up high. So what's happening is when I flush it, it will come up very high and the shower over here will gurgle, there, that's gurgling now, 
because it's linked to the same drain pipe that the toilet's linked to. And also this one here. Now, if I, I filled it with water, if I do this and do this, it will all kind of bubble. So 100%, there's some sort of blockage going on. That will drain down, listen. There you go, water, dirty water coming up. Yeah. So we've definitely got a, uh, a blockage in the pipe. Now, is that related to the leak? I don't know. I hate stuff like this. Oh my God, there we go. Okay, well that's, that's sewer water, isn't it? Well, I've drawn you a quick diagram. Obviously my skills aren't just on fixing things as well. My artwork is probably within the top 1% of the world, as you can tell. So that's me in the shower with turds floating around the place. And then we have a drain coming out here. I think this is probably gonna be about inch and a half. Maybe it goes to two inch. And then we have the toilet here with the flexible hose this little bit here, and it connects onto a Y because the pipe from the shower has to connect onto this because we've only got one pipe going away. Also, the pipe work, which is gonna be inch and a half coming from the sink, will be coming along here, and I presume it joins into, because look at the height difference, it joins into this bottom pipe here. So this bottom pipe has to be like a Y-shaped configuration, and then it goes along here to the next bathroom. So uh, that's it there. That's what I think happens, but I don't really know. The pipe work comes down here through this little access thing, which if I undone now, loads of water would come out and then through there. And then basically it goes through the wall down there. You can see the, the big four inch or whatever it is pipe there, four and a half inch sewer pipe there. And then I presume it goes straight across here into my bathroom. And then I think it's under the floor here. And then I presume that's what this thing is all hiding because that feels hollow. Again, this is a 1972 house. So I, I haven't had to get involved with this before. But look, if I flush this toilet, this one is working fine. So there isn't a blockage from here going outside, which is good. It looks like the blockage is from here going back this way. But is that anything to do with the leak? Because this blockage has only happened, as far as I know, today and yet the leak's been here for a couple of months. Yeah, so uh, see, that's not going down now. If I was to flush that again now, it would probably overflow. <laughs> oh, this is a nightmare. Anyway, let me show you the water on this wall here. So, see how deep it is here? That's because this is actually going to a downstairs cupboard. So you can see the wood there. Well, not it's not like, sopping sopping wet but you can see the difference in the color of the wood yeah so the wall's wet and basically it's soaking now into that wood there right there you go so you can see it glistening away for itself and the difference in the wood there you can see a dry bit of wood and the wet wood so there's something leaking onto that this wall but i put my hands under all these pipes here yeah i felt around all underneath them and there's no leak i've even felt the bottom of this soil pipe as much as i can it's not that easy and that doesn't feel wet annoyingly i think i'm going to have to lift the carpet back and see if there's any loose not floorboards because this is a 1970s house so it's all chipboard which is the the bane of uh, repair because you can't get to any any of it because it's massive chipboard as well as that i'm limited in tools because a lot of my tools are in the rolls royce but the way i look at it is that something must have been done here before to get that pipe in so there must be some chipboard here that can be lifted let me show you the cupboard underneath there which makes it a little bit more complicated because i think it might be asbestos again 1970s house there's going to be traces of asbestos around the place which is a shame that's the bit of wood that i took out from the floor if you have a look here so basically this is it here yeah so that's why it's so deep so the wall it's this wall that's wet. So how can this wall be wet on this side? Yeah, so it's coming through. You know, that side's wet. So I presume this side's wet because there's nothing leaking on that side. How can this side be wet if there's nothing here? Right, so I need to lift up the carpet. This is Axminster carpet, so it's very good quality. So as long as I don't rip it when I lift it up, I'm hoping it will go back down again. Okay. So uh, just in case you say it, of course I'm using the wrong tools. I haven't even got all my tools here at the moment because they're in the car. And I'm not a carpet fitter, I'm not a plumber, I'm not anything. I'm just uh, trying to fix this. So you don't have to talk about the fact that I haven't got the correct tools because it's obvious. Right, so we've got the gripper rods. These are uh, great for uh, going straight through your fingers. The gripper rods are just at the edge here and they actually grip the carpet in place. 
So I'm just fast forwarding through this bit here, just trying to get all the carpet up. So far in this video, I haven't stabbed myself in any of the gripper rods, which is a given. It's gonna happen. But uh, yeah, so far, so good. Another thing which is good is the My Mate Vince Massive. The members this month are kipdigital.com, Kip Hakes, and Max Rockatansky. Having fun repairs, Chris Seal, Felipe at mrkeeps.com, DJVG, Pigsy, Robert from Timsey's Auto Air, Daniel Watson, Anthony Dean, Baza2, Russ Mellinson, Gaspar Heller, Ricard Berglund, Jacob Culpin, Matt Rawlins, Soul Reaver555, Dorian from Hoover Lux Restorations, and Angry Al tech thank you so much guys so now we have the carpet up we have to now undo some of the chipboard to give us access below okay all the screws are undone they actually came out really easy just with a normal screwdriver without the electric screwdriver so all is good all right i've got a blunt chisel here Let's see if i can lift this up yes i can oh i don't think that's going to tell me anything Right, well, I can see the saw pipe anyway. Right, let's see what is going down. Nothing is going down. There's no water there. Let's get the torch. That's completely and utterly dry. How about this one here? And that is completely dry. Right, so that is all good. Oh, you can see it's been re... Uh, plasterboarded that's the kitchen you can see the original plasterboard there and then they put new plasterboard up there as well all right let's have a look down here see if we can see anything no so i can just see two wires and they would be feeding the light switch downstairs so it's not uh, it's dry there I say it's dry there, but no, I can clearly see that there is some sort of patch there. Uh, annoyingly, I didn't put my hand down to feel whether that was actually wet or not, but there's certainly a patch there. Can we see down this one at all? That down there is dry. What is going on? I wonder has the soil pipe got a, a join? I wonder, can I see a join on it? Because maybe it's leaking out the join. No, that looks like a continuous pipe. What is going on? Where is this leak coming from? I mean, there wouldn't be any pipes just run... Let's look back in here. There wouldn't be any pipes just run in this bit, would there? I've got some central heat in plastic pipes there, but they're all dry. It's not really an option to take up this. I'm going to have to take up everything. Well, it goes under here. The wall's been built on top of it. Well, this is a nightmare. So that's the join there. Look, and it's been... I don't think it's a push fit one. It looks like a solvent well join. You know, where they used a glue. So it's going to be very unlikely to have failed from there. And anyway, I can get my hand under it and it's not wet. What is causing the wetness at the bottom down here? What is causing that there? Well, it's a mystery to me, but today the toilet is blocked. Yet I had water damage on the ceiling downstairs a couple of months ago. So I'm just going to sort out the blockage. At this moment in time, I don't really know if the blockage is related to the leak. I think it is, but it could be two separate things. So let's just sort out the blockage. Well, this is interesting. So my son just came out of the uh, bedroom. And he was like, uh, oh, Dad, yeah, I forgot to tell you, I had a shower last night and it nearly overflowed over here, so it wasn't draining. So, uh, yeah, and now look, that's not draining now. And I pulled this out earlier. There's no big hair blockage. That's not blocked there. How would that stop it from going down? What's happening on the toilet? That's bubbling as well. Might give my dad a ring, he might have more knowledge about this. Uh, well, it's not draining anyway. So 100% we've got a blockage. Where is that blockage? I'm wondering if I should buy some rod in something or other. I can see that you can buy this thing here, a little pipe drain cleaning coil. 
It's only 14 pounds, so I might get it. This screw fix catalog is out of date, but something similar would be around now. I have got this thing that I use for uh, fishing through for, you know, like electrical wires and stuff like that. So I might try putting that down in there just in case, because I think the blockage is gonna be on that Y shape somewhere. That's what I'm thinking now, which is gonna be better news than having to dismantle that whole cupboard in there to try to fix a tiny weep. I think I'll live with the weep, because I don't think, I reckon the weep might have been there from, uh, you know, from years and years and years ago, but it's never bothered anybody. So yeah, okay, I'm gonna get the tripod out, undo that, see what's happening. Well, I tried to put this fishing wire rod type thing through into it, and uh, to be fair, I do manage to get quite a bit down there, but I don't hear any gurgling, I don't seem to come across much resistance, and when I pull it out, it does have a few bits of toilet roll on it, but it's not really doing anything. So then I turn my attention to the actual toilet, and it seems weird trying to rod the whole toilet with this little fishing wire rod thing, which is only a few millimeters across. Anyway, I do get loads of it down there, but because it's so thin, I'm not sure if it's just doubling up on itself. You know what I mean? It might be coiling up somewhere. If it hits against a bend, it might just keep coiling rather than finding, you know, you need a thicker rod really to go down there to uh, actually push its way through whatever the blockage is. So I, I don't have any luck with it at all. So then I just attempt to do this using my good old fashioned hand and throwing water down there. And then this happens. Just gonna try to throw the water down there. There we go. Look at that. That was good, that went down quick. Right, this one's slow to fill up because it's uh, from the tank upstairs, it's not off the mains. I wonder what that I've, I wonder what that I've sorted it. Oh -ho. But that wasn't a full flush. This reminds me of how I spent my 18th birthday. I was in Ibiza, the first holiday away from the parents because we just used to go to Ireland every year like the lads holiday just when I finished college and uh, yeah I don't know what I think I was introduced that night to tequila or something like that and uh, I remember making it into the bathroom into the restrooms and then I remember making it into the cubicle and I remember being like this anyway next thing I remember is that uh, I woke up in complete darkness and I basically seen a crack of light and a crack of light and I thought what and then basically I fumbled around for the door, opened it up, and then uh, I seen more, a little bit more light. And then I opened up the next doors to be blinded by a load of light, and there was a load of cleaners in the club. And it was daytime, well, early morning, it was about six in the morning. So basically the club closed at whatever time it was too, and I was left in the toilets all night long. And then looking down on my shirt, I was covered in sick, understandably, because I do remember getting sick, Black stuff, I presume that's from rolling around on the floor, and blood as well. But the blood would have been from nosebleeds because I used to get nosebleeds all the time back then because it was linked to hay fever. So I think the inside of my nostril linings were really thin. So the least little thing would cause a nosebleed. I could sneeze and get a nosebleed, but uh, yeah. So that was eventful. Right, okay, let's see if it's gonna work now. Oh, hallelujah. Look at that. Fantastic. So great news, it's about four days later now and it's still not blocked and it's still flushing just fine. Showers in use, no gurgling, no nothing. And obviously it's all been put back here as if nobody's ever been under here, which is fantastic. That was until today. Let me show you what my son pointed out downstairs. That's one of his latest artworks, it's nice isn't it? That's a painting that back of a Porsche. Copied off the internet, it is a picture off the internet, but it looks good. Anyway, he said, Dad, oh no, look at this, are you ready? Before there was just a little mark up here. Now look after my meddling, ta-da! <laughs> and it's not just from me splashing about the place. Basically, when I finished, this wasn't there. This has come up since. Isn't that fantastic? 
you know what? I do not know what to do because up in the upstairs cupboard, it's going to be a complete nightmare because everything will have to come out of it. Maybe I should take away the ceiling down here, but that's going to be a complete nightmare. Or do I lift the toilet and stuff and try to get to it from there? I just don't know. If I lift the toilet and then the leak is more that way, which it looks to be beyond the toilet, then I'm going to be absolutely gutted. So uh, yeah, right now, I don't know what to do. I'm not doing any more in this video. I just feel like running away, if I'm honest with you, and just burying my head in some sand somewhere. But uh, yeah, I'm gutted. I can't tell you how gutted I am because it's a problem that I need to sort. And right now, I just haven't got a huge amount of time to be dealing with this. But yeah, I have to deal with it because sooner or later, I think the ceiling will collapse and I'll just have a, a sewer full of uh, excrement coming down on my nice Axminster carpet. Ah, oh, gutted. Anyway, let's move on to the next item. But yet again, that was a failure from my mate Vince. So here we have an Energizer hard case. It's a little torch here, 75 lumens, and also it's magnetic. But what happens is it doesn't turn on and off. When we screw up the battery at the bottom here, this switch here is not working. So let's take it apart and see what's happening. So this was part of an Amazon returns box that I got and they currently cost about 11 pounds here in the UK. We've got four little screws up here, so let's undo these and see if this will give us access to this little on and off switch. Okay, so that pops off here. Now we've got the LED there, and does that give us access to the board here? Right, well, the switch is on the board here, so this is a little waterproof top, but I can actually see the switch just down in here. So let's get some pliers and pull it out. Right, it looks like I can't actually pull it out until I unsolder this bit here, so let's do that. It's incredibly hard to get out, but that's the only way that I can see that they would have been able to put it in. I'm just worried about damaging the components on the board because I can't really see what's here. Here we go. Let's put that wire to the side and hopefully it will come out. Yes. Right, so here we have it. Ah, oh, there we go, switch has jammed, it's a switch problem. Right, let's zoom in and see if we can work out what's what. Yeah, it's just stuck down there, it's not going to go back up. You have to kind of flick it to get it back up. Right, is there something foul in it? Right, this is a problem here. Can you see that we have a little arrow type thing here? And right now, that metal is stuck on that side. Yeah, now it's gone, correct. So look, it goes up here, goes into there, and then should come down, it's not coming down. So you kind of have to flick it. Sometimes it works, but other times it doesn't. So it looks like it's getting caught on the way down. So let's try to just widen it up a little bit on the way down. Unfortunately, widening up doesn't help. Using the pliers, I'm just kind of marking it up rather than widening the gap. What I need to do is I need to strip the switch down so we can actually move that metal thing more over to the left-hand side. Because at this moment in time, it's not wanting to go down because it's getting caught, but if it was slightly moved to the left by bending it, then naturally it would want to go over to the correct side on the way up, but also on the way down, it will push itself more over to the bottom. So uh, I think something like this is, they must be made in their thousands or millions, and I suppose sometimes tolerance might be just a little bit out. If one bit is a little bit out and another bit's a little bit out, maybe it ends in this one here, where it will turn itself on and off sometimes, but the majority of times it won't work. So we need to strip the switch down, and then I'll show you what I'm gonna do. Right, so let's pop the spring back in here. Now, let's 
guide it where it should be to begin with. Right, so I put the lid back on and unfortunately it's doing the same thing. If I flick it, it will work. But what's happening is, I'm not gonna be able to flick it when the top's on. So I'm gonna take it apart again and this time I'm gonna put a little bend on that top bit so it's pointing more over this way and it'd be more inclined to go up here when it's going, when it's down. The problem is it's not, uh, it's not clearing. It's wanting to go back up this same way here and that's why you have to kind of flick it to make it work. Right, so as you can see, I put a little kink going up this way. So now it's forced into there, but then when it goes down here, it wants to go back up that way on the way up. So I think now that's gonna work. Right, check it out. There, yeah. it seems to be clicking more now. And I'm not having to flick it. Even if I go slow, it's working. So let's solder it back in and see if it's working. Right, check it out. Every single time it works now and I don't have to do it fast or flick it, just completely normal operation. So there we have it, the end of trying to fix everything. A nice variety of faults, I'm sure you'll agree. Favourite one by far was this one because it's not often that you see a bridge chip from manufacture. So that was very interesting, nice and easy to fix as well. And closely followed by this one. I really like this one because I need a little torch and it's working every single time. UPS, not really sure if it was or it wasn't a fix. Only time will tell on that one. Was it the UPS that made the batteries go faulty or was it the batteries that failed just from being constantly charged who knows, I'm not too sure. Nebula projector was a big shame. That would have been great to get that working, but it's just far too complicated and I just cannot see anything that's wrong with it. I think you need another one in order to fault find that one. And then if you had two, you'd be able to swap things around. You may have more chance of fixing it, but I really do believe it's gonna be a chip problem. I don't think it's gonna be an easy thing to fix. And lastly, it was a massive fail on the blocked toilet upstairs. I'm dreading looking into that further, but needs must, I have to do it. So uh, it's just one of those things where if you put off, it's only gonna get worse and then I'll have to replace the whole ceiling. So I've just gotta get on with that as quick as possible. I may or may not film it, I don't know. I'll give you an update no matter what it is in a future video anyway. So that's it, hopefully in the future I'll do more, trying to fix everything, just a wide variety of different things, not just electronic things. So uh, yeah, if you enjoyed it, give it a big thumbs up and I will hopefully see you all very soon. Thank you so much for watching.